Hello and welcome to Practical Inclusion. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I live, work and play on, which are the Wadawurrung people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present, and a huge big call out to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are joining us today. Um, please know that, yes, that Invasion Day <laughs> circus has ended, but that doesn't mean that we're, there's not many of us still um, trying to be as good at allies as we possibly can and um, always taking advice on how we can do that better across the whole calendar year um, and not just in those days of significance that, that pop up and, and have conversations surrounding them. Woody, would you like to acknowledge country before we get started? Thank you, Bri. I also like to extend my acknowledgement to the land that I work and live in the Wurundjeri land of the Kulin Nation and pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. Beautiful. Thank you. And thank you so much for coming back on this show with me. We've only had a few come back twice. Um, <laughs> so I you know, feel very privileged that you've given us more of your time. Um, for those who haven't come across please do. Um, Ananda, Ananda, I got that right. Um, you got that. <laughs> I told you I was having a day. <laughs> this could be an interesting 30 minutes. <laughs> I'll post the link up in the comments anyway, if you need training and consulting, um, particularly with that intersectional focus, um, this is the person to go to for sure. And this is the organisation. And you work with Maria, who I'm a huge, huge fan of. So you couldn't, you couldn't be in better hands. Yes, yes. So I'm, I'm, I'm the one who's holding Maria's handbag when while she's saying hello to a zillion people that admire her. So if you see that person standing behind Maria, that's usually me just holding the <laughs> handbag very patiently. <laughs> A very privileged role, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> now, I asked you to come on um, because of the recent Pride Round kind of media frenzy um, mm -hmm. that occurred and a post that I made. Um, and it was, for those who aren't up to date with this, um, the AFLW had their Pride Round. Um, and at GWS, there's a Muslim woman player um, and she made the decision not to play in the Pride round. Um, her name Zurika is her name. You, if you haven't seen the reports, you can. The article that I thought was great too was definitely Rana Hussain wrote a really um, thoughtful piece on it in The Guardian if you want to catch yourself up. Um, but what I, I made a post about it and, and my thoughts and opinions on this. And this has always kind of sat uncomfortably with me when we force people into taking on inclusion kind of initiatives or participating in inclusion initiatives. And we see this in the workplace very commonly um, that people get really kind of bad feedback if they don't participate, if they're not wearing their rainbow lanyards um, or if they're not going along to the ally training. Um, and I think that it's not a great practice, but we can talk about all of that later. I made a post about it, but what I failed to do was centre the voices of queer Muslims in that conversation. Um, and I was called out on it very rightly so, or called in on it um, by a beautiful person who commented, um, and also from Buddy who wrote such a beautiful message on, on the post as well. And um, so sticking my hand up here, um, we all get this stuff wrong. There's no doubt about that. Um, and I continue to get it wrong and continue to get um, educated and learn more and just move further along that journey. I absolutely look at life through a lens of white privilege. I have that, um, always will probably have that um, need to continually work day to day to try and um, reflect and challenge myself when I do make posts like this and don't centre the voices of those who, who it affects most acutely. Um, and so I reached out and Buddy was just so beautiful to say yes, that they would come on um, and have this conversation with me today. So what I want to do is absolutely pass that mic. Um, <laughs> and, and Buddy, I really love to hear your thoughts on that whole kind of media train that happened um, and, and the actual decision itself. Um, um, but also then we'll talk a little bit um, after that perhaps on 
how we take these learnings for, you know, advice that you have for us white people working in this space and how we take these learnings and continue to try and do better. Oh, thank you so much, Bree. And, you know, I, I, I'd like to invite you to change that framework as well. You know, we, we don't, yes, we, we always, we, we get things wrong. I get things wrong. It's just the same as you. Every single day I will say something, I will do something, and people will call me up for it and say, have you actually considered from this lens? So, you know, and, and quite often when we frame it as being wrong, some people can get really defensive on that. So we mm. always ask people, you know, maybe maybe we can approach it from a different angle. So I always ask mm. people, this is not about getting rid things wrong or right, because those duality is actually not um, conducive to the conversation. Mm -hmm. We're always going to have people who are going to be very defensive, and we're always going to have people who are going to say, assert that their view is the right view. We know in diversity and inclusion, we know when it comes to intersectionality, the gray area is where we live in. Mm -hmm. And it's followed to the conversation about um, Hanim, where it was for, 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 for me as a queer Muslim and having conversation with other queer Muslims as well, we can, we can see the gray area we live in the gray area. What has been so damaging to us was when the post, when, when, uh, when the article was posted in the media, and I had a quick, quick look about how is the mainstream media going to frame this? Whenever there's a word Muslim, our guard is up. We were just like, how is this going to be framed? And it was, such a it was so difficult to see some headlines that basically say Muslim AFLW player um, don't want to wear pride jumper. Mm -hmm. So for many of us, it reignites this Islamophobia that we have lived through our lives. For me, the Islamophobia that I have experienced since I moved to Australia there was no conversation there was very little conversation about the dialogue that happening within the club within aflw there was no conversation about that we acknowledge that hanin actually approached this topic with respect you know mm -hmm. by saying look you know i am the only one this is my reading of her statement i am the only one i am the only queer like i am the only muslim player in the whole aflw I have so many things that people expect of me. And this is where I have to find that really, really delicate balance. And so when, when I speak to other queer Muslims, because we are living in that gray area, so we understand it. Doesn't mean that we completely support it, but we understand the situation. Mm -hmm. And for us, it was that Islamophobia that we were very, very, very attuned to. So in, in some LGBTIQA plus spaces as well, some of the commentaries was very Islamophobic. Some of the commentaries was not only Islamophobic, but also sexist. A queer mm. Muslim woman. Well, not queer, sorry, a Muslim woman. Yeah. Mm. So that sexism coming through very clear. So this is the thing where, where you know, where I, where I approach you about having this conversation. It's about centering that experience of queer Muslims. How do we see this issue? And for me, as someone who works, you know, in the community, who's been invited to do some speeches, some training, it's always about have we actually engaged in conversation with the Muslim communities about LGBTIQ A plus stuff that is actually culturally safe, that actually talks about, this is not about changing your belief, this is not about changing your interpretation of the Holy Book or the Quran. This is about inviting you to have a conversation with us so all of us can understand each other and all of us can actually work towards creating a bridge between the two worlds that's seemingly different, but 
there's actually people who are living in those two worlds, <laughs> including me. <laughs> so yeah, so this is this is a whole conversation that is actually missing mm -hmm. because the whole media drama was about a Muslim person who's against queer stuff. Mm -hmm. okay. It's more complex than that. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I saw that as soon as you actually, if you actually read the statement that she made, um, you saw very quickly that this wasn't so, this wasn't an Israel Falau no. <laughs> in any shape of, you know, you know, there's just no connection at all. This is somebody who, and, and when I looked at it, I'm like, I don't, I have no opportunity at currently I haven't sought that opportunity to understand what it would be like mm -hmm. from her perspective what challenges um and influences that she's got and you know she's 20 isn't she um she's, oh she's oh, she's younger than us let's put it that way <laughs> she's <laughs> and, 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 half our age and, <laughs> and and to put that much pressure like you say to put that much pressure you know if we took we, we take a gender lens from the gender lens in itself is already a lot of pressure. You know, mm -hmm. being a Muslim woman who plays in AFW, and that's some of the sexist comment that I saw. Uh, isn't your religion not allowing you to wear shorts anyway? Isn't your religion mm -hmm. meant to make you you meant to cover up? And I and I'm just I was so taken back by that. Because for me, that's an indication that Islamophobia is still very much alive. And they're looking for any opportunity to target people. So when Hanin came up with the statement, the sexism, the Islamophobia, some of the, um, you know, some of the geographic location as well, because it's Western Sydney, and some people are commenting about the Western Sydney. I mean, I'm, 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 in, I'm, I'm in Melbourne. I have no idea what Western Sydney is like. But then all that, that pile on, and that's what intersectionality is, all that piling on, it's actually quite damaging because we don't, we haven't been able to use it as an opportunity to establish dialogues. What we have been using is actually targeting a specific um, incident or a specific um, situation. Mm -hmm. And we have been using it to weaponize it to create this us against them mentality. Us mm -hmm. against them, as we know, in diversity and inclusion, that's not that's, that's just not how we work in, mm -hmm. when it comes to intersectionality. That's just not going to work. So, yeah, like you're right, all this pressure being put on one person, mm -hmm. it's, just, it, it's just not fair. No, no, absolutely. It's, it's not fair. And as you say, you know, somebody who becomes the, it's that one incident that, incident that then becomes a, a national conversation. Um, yeah. Which should have been had, which should have been, already ongoing i love the words that you've used there like creating that bridge um mm -hmm. between the two communities that and that you're a part of both of them and how you you manage that um that relationship i suppose going forward it's yeah you've, you've just added so much to, to that conversation and to my understanding too already um buddy i want to kind of move then that same thinking let's move into the workplace Mm -hmm. And we have, we're at Purple Day, Ida Hobbit, mm -hmm. um, you know, all of those kind of events. There is the, the Rainbow Lanyards. I talk to clients and, I, and they're asking me about delivering LGBTIQA plus training and they say we want everybody to attend. This is going to be compulsory. Um, and my ankles go up straight away. Um, what are your thoughts and experiences around workplace inclusion and how we, we balance that line of saying, yes, this is the behaviours that we want to see in our workplace. We, we mm -hmm. don't want Islamophobia. We don't want homophobia, all of these things. Um, but not, you know, also being respectful in the way that we do that of the diversity that we have mm. in our workplaces. This is, this is the danger of just having one conversation in the whole 12 months or 11 months, you know, considering people's taking leave, in the whole 11 months of being in the workplace and having one conversation once a year. 
this is the problem that we've been mm -hmm. keep inviting organizations to not do that. Because what happened is in a diverse workforce, as you aware of and as you experience yourself, people who are already buying in to the idea, of course, they will come. They are already our allies. They are our friends. They are members of the community. The conversation that needs to happen in the rest of the year is to get people to understand that supporting the rights of LGBTIQIA plus does not necessarily mean changing people's belief when it comes to their faith. If their faith have really, really strong view about LGBTIQIA plus community, and most of those views are quite negative, then the, the task is actually to invite them to sit with us and to actually understand that embracing human rights doesn't impinge on each other's right. Embracing human rights is about creating that space where we can coexist. And for mm -hmm. us to coexist, we need to have a relationship with each other. We need to be able to understand each other and respect each other so this again this duality of if you're not against us then you are or if you're not with us then you are against us this duality that we inadvertently have created in diversity and in inclusion we need to challenge that we need to actually invest more on bringing people in and bringing people in by um you know uh, by 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 as talking to the faith communities. Look, believe what you want to believe that is within your right. Can you see where there is a space for people who are queer that actually aligns with your faith? And a lot of faith communities, including what I believe in, we have this thing called compassion. We have this thing called all souls are sacred and all souls are created by God. We are gifts of God. We should not, we should not create wars with each other. We should prevent separation and segregation just because we don't always be agreeing with each other. That's from my, you know, from my you know, 40 years of life, that's, that's, that's the kind of faith that I cling on to. And the one, the similarity that I see amongst different faith groups this belief that we all created by God and we all created, our, our task is to unite instead of to segregate. If we can find a channel to incorporate queer rights by using that, then hopefully that will start, people start having understanding, oh, that's okay. So you're gay, you're trans, you're lesbian, you're bi, that's completely fine. I don't actually understand it myself completely. My faith is telling me something else but you are a person, I am a person, we are in the workplace. Mm. Let's, let's have that relationship. Let's respect each other enough. Mm. And we all know this, social change happens when people are connecting with each other. Mm. When people are sitting down, building that relationship, when people are start to understand the systemic discrimination, that discrimination is actually invented, not built in. <laughs> you know, we, we have a built-in prejudice, but discrimination is actually invented. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. the moment the moment we start unpacking that and the moment we let go of our own ego and start linking and relating to people from as a person to person, then that's where I can see um, organizations and companies start moving forward. Instead of having this constant dilemma, what you said before, this constant talk of war between people who are already part of it and people who don't want to be part of it, but they never actually been given the opportunity, the invitation to actually to sit and listen. So they are, I'm the same as you, compulsory. I have a love-hate relationship with it. Like, mm -hmm. yes, like, I, I can understand the need to be compulsory, but are you if you are compelled if you're making everyone to go for this one day again what have you done for the rest of the year to yeah. invite people in exactly and, and actually what harm are you doing mm. because those people who don't want to go they don't want to go and, yeah. and and we're there teaching about confirmation bias so they're just looking for the information that confirms that they were right <laughs> 
<laughs> and we and we are looking for our co our own confirmation bias. So, it's so yeah. yeah, no, I thought they were um, homophobic, and and now I know for sure. Look at the way they answered that question, or, or the way they roll their eyes. Absolutely. And when we bring intersectionality in here, that's what I've been hearing over and over again. Ah, uh, you know, we have a so we have a group of staff who's most of them come from you know multicultural communities. Most of them come from faith communities. Um, they don't usually go to these things. And I just go, well, have you actually talked to them? And they're like, ah, uh, you know, but we want to respect their 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 faith and their their culture. And I said, well, have you actually engaged with them? And usually the answer is no. So you know, this is uh, this is going to be even more being is there is a potential for this situation to be even more complicated now that you know we talked about this before that this religious discrimination bill is going to be introduced to Parliament today. Uh, I just don't know where to begin with that. <laughs> No, and that's exactly where I was going to move us to because I know we've got 10 minutes. Um, keep your comments going, people, questions. I'm sure this conversation will continue after the 30 minutes on online anyway on the, in the comment thread. Um, but let's talk about the bill. What what are your biggest concerns right now about what's going to happen post now, I suppose, that the, that the bill should have been tabled or will be tabled? Oh, uh, you're asking me to choose one. That is not fair. <laughs> okay, a couple. <laughs> Intersectionality, more than one. Um, <laughs> there are so many potential issues, and we just talked about it just now. You know, the bill, as I understand it now, will override state and other federal bills that actually protect the rights of. Um, minority groups, marginalized groups, including LGBTIQ um, people of faith, um, people who are of non-Christian faith and um, race and uh, disability and many more. So when this bill is introduced and if it is going to override the fair work law that actually prevent discrimination in the workplace, mm -hmm. then how are we going to create a cohesive and um, workplace where the statement of faith is privilege over the rights of LGBTIQ. Mm -hmm. How about people like myself, who is a queer Muslim? Where do we sit in this? <laughs> like we, we just don't know. We don't know where we sit in this. Yes, mm -hmm. I want my faith to be protected. Yes, I want my um, gay identity, my non-binary identity to be protected as well. And there hasn't been a lot of conversation about this. You know, it's always been us against them. So it's either faith communities or LGBTIQ plus communities. So there is going to be a real consequences in the workplace. How is HR going to manage um, the um, employment code of conducts, the, you know, the, all the policy, inclusion policies, all the diversity policies? while at the same time you have potentially this bill that will allow people to say things and do things and then claim it as a statement of faith. Mm -hmm. Who's going to monitor that statement of faith? What is a statement of faith? Which one? I'm a Muslim. We have so many statements of faith. <laughs> you know, I have no idea which one that they're going to privilege. And I always remind people, let's not kid ourselves here. This bill was introduced as part of a negotiation to allow for same-sex marriage plebiscite. Mm -hmm. That's the only reason. And yeah. why that was negotiated was because back then, some politicians were following the US-based politics where they were kind of kept saying, you know, the um, Christian baker has the right to refuse making wedding cakes for gay couples. Mm -hmm. We've been having same-sex marriage for how long now? Four years? We never heard any case of a baker refusing to actually earn money. <laughs> if anything, they increase their profit margin by having all the <laughs> Irish weddings. Exactly. <laughs> Make a, uh, fortune. <laughs> yeah, make a fortune yeah and and our communities like to party let's face it so, so we don't we're not afraid of spending money right? <laughs> uh, so this is this is what people forgetting like this is this is not just this is this is 
um, using faith and religion to mask that uncomfortableness about changing the marriage definition between a man and a woman to two people. And, and, and we have to keep going back to it. And that's one thing that we keep reminding politicians as well. Religious exemption already exists in the existing federal laws. What we want is a religious, is, is an, uh, is a religious discrimination bill that doesn't impinge on any other rights that is already protected. Yeah. And is it, I don't think that's how, what the federal government is thinking. Um, and I'm still not sure what the opposition um, position is on this. Mm. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, I love that you've brought back to that reason that it was introduced in the first place because that had completely gone out of my mind too because um, it's, you know, it, it's been so long and yet it has been sitting there that whole time and it was because of that. And I don't know, for those of you who have caught any media today or yesterday about it, um, that there is now this idea that, you know, in response to the that ridiculous principal in that Queensland mm -hmm. school, um, that they are apparently making an amendment that ensures that lesbian and gay children can't be expelled from school. Um, which totally has left out trans and gender diverse kids is what the, the news is saying, um, who we know are at almost, well, they are at the greatest risk um, in our schools, absolutely, um, and in our communities and in their homes. And I, I was talking to somebody, and I mentioned this last week, you know, for so many people in Australia, they think, well, they can just choose to go to another school. No, they can't. Their parents enrolled them there. Mm. If, if it was their choice, they wouldn't be there in the first place. Mm. Um, but their parents enrolled them in these schools and those schools should have an absolute duty of care um, to protect them for who they are. Um, Absolutely, and yeah. yeah. I, I just want to quickly jump in here, and we, when we bring intersectional lens to it, you know, some, um, you know, some some parents send their children to faith-based schools for a very good reason. They want their children mm -hmm. to be aware of their faith. They want their children to be familiar of their faith. And when that clashes with queer rights, you know, and people are saying, "Well, the parents should take them out," it's not that easy because one thing mm -hmm. that faith schools, faith-based schools provide is a sense of community connection. And when you take that out of people's lives, it can actually do more damage to people's mental health than actually supporting them. So when we don't, when we are not willing to have that conversation, when we are not willing to have that dialogues about what is the best way to do this, you know, when we talk about faith schools, we talk about um, queer um, queer kids. And I take your point as well. You know, they see gay and lesbian as being separate to trans. We know some trans and gender diverse young people and individuals like myself are also same sex attracted or attracted mm -hmm. to the same gender. Mm -hmm. So when I read the news this morning in my head, I just kept thinking, not again. This is another divide and conquer. We're going to divide the queer communities and we're going to protect some, but not the rest. And maybe the community will have will, will follow that. We not we, we we ain't stupid. We've been doing this activism for a good like half a half a decade, half, half a, like fifty years or even more, <laughs> like you know, yeah, half a century. That's so we we ain't stupid. We know exactly <laughs> what they're trying to do. Yeah. And we're going to rise up against that. Yeah, absolutely. So if you uh, notice we're, we're getting very short on time, if you haven't yet written to your ministers, just do it. Just send them a note, please. The more they receive, let's bombard their inboxes. Check out the organisations that are leading some great advocacy in this space. Um, obviously, follow people like Buddy, also Alistair Laurie on Twitter. He was on the show as well. Um, an absolute expert in in all things policy and particularly, you know, such a strong um, advocate for LGBTIQA plus rights. So jump on and, and follow him on Twitter. But did you have others do you want to call out that people can follow to learn more? Uh, look, you can drop names like there's no tomorrow. So I forget people's names, but yeah. <laughs> 
please do follow people and really look at what they stand for and also um, try to look for um, try to follow people who have that intersectional lens to really mm -hmm. kind of expand our thinking so i can only speak from the faith and multicultural perspective we got intersectionality from disability faith and ethnicity and uh, first nations as well so please follow them to really improve our understanding yeah no it's an absolute great call out um and for everybody to to keep that in mind myself included thank you so much for coming on again today um we obviously everybody you can share this around on linkedin or, or through youtube facebook um the captions are automatic but they'll be on pretty much straight away so um, you can share that from YouTube if you're wanting those captions on there, which hopefully you do. Um, we'll get you on again, please. <laughs> that would be wonderful. <laughs> it will be an honour. Thank you so much for inviting me back, Bree. Oh, no, it's beautiful. Beautiful conversation. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for listening in. Bye.